the tragic synagogue shooting in California. Friends, we've been warning that things like this would happen. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, friends, to The Line of Fire. Michael Brown, what an intense weekend we had. So much to share, so much to talk about. And friends, we have been raising our voices for weeks, well, for years, for decades. But in recent weeks, we have been issuing warnings. We have been talking about the rising tide of, quote, Christian anti-Semitism. We have been talking about the dangers. We have been talking about the potential violence And then we see these horrors take place this weekend. This is something we must address. I believe you're going to find today's broadcast very, very important, very, very eye-opening. If you'd like to weigh in on today's subject, not just general questions, general comments, but today's subject, the synagogue shooting, anti-Semitism in the New York Times, the rising tide of, quote, Christian anti-Semitism. Phone lines are open, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884 is the number to call. And and I want to start off by going immediately to my friend and colleague, Rabbi Shmuley Boteach, known as America's most famous rabbi. We've become close friends over the years in the midst of our many, many debates And he is a leading voice constantly calling America to wake up to the rising tide of anti-Semitism. So, guys, I am unable to get on my normal screen, so I just need you to bring Rabbi Shmuley on for me. You can bring him on the line. I want to get to my guest immediately, and I'm going to weigh in after he has time to express himself. Uh, Shmuley, are you with us? Hey, Mike, how are you? Uh, doing, Doing well, doing well. Glad to talk with you and uh, looking forward to seeing you again, God willing, this summer in New York. Oh, that's right. We have our event coming up. We haven't done a live discussion debate in quite a few years after doing so many. So I look forward greatly. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, Shmuley, you, you have links that go back to Chabad, the, the same group where the tragic shooting took place uh, this Saturday, this past Shabbat, at the last day of Passover. You've been steadily raising your voice about concerns about the rising tide of anti-Semitism in America, Democrat Party, New York Times. Just speak from your heart to our audience. How urgent a time is this? How much does America need to wake up to what's happening? Firstly, Mike, uh, I want to thank all of your listeners. Uh, I'm guessing that they are predominantly evangelical Christians. Correct. um, Like yourself and uh, their friendship with the Jewish people, their stalwart support for Israel is uh, so appreciated in our community and by the state of Israel and by people of conscience. Uh, the rise of anti-Semitism in our time is something I never would have predicted, not on this scale, not, uh, not 70 years after the Holocaust. We, we really thought that the Holocaust was of such a terrible magnitude that the world would almost scare itself with how much it despised the Jews. It's one thing to harbor bigotry and, and, and prejudices. It's quite another to engage in, in genocide, in, in mass murder on that scale. So we thought that anti-Semitism would be in abeyance, that people would understand how, how serious it is. So this is all a, a terrible shock that we now see Jeremy Corbyn on the verge of becoming the prime minister of Britain, where I lived for 11 years, who's an out-and-out Jew hater. Uh, who says that he admires Hamas and Hezbollah, the blood, bloodthirsty terrorists. Elon Omar. Uh, we never thought that in the halls of Congress we'd have people roaming who actually uh, are a mouthpiece for things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, accusations that the Jews buy off, control the world with their money, buy off politicians with their Benjamins, their cash. We didn't think we'd have Rashida Tlaib, who would be accusing Jews of dual loyalty. These, these are the halls of Congress. These, this is not the fringe. This is not the margins. This is the highest halls of power. And it's quite shocking. 
And what it all leads to, this culture of demonization of the Jewish people, defamation of the Jewish people, let alone uh, white nationalist supremacists who are just vile, despicable human beings. They, they violate every principle of the Bible uh, in their hatred of groups that are not like them. Many of them claim to be Christians, but of course they're fraudulent Christians. They're not religious in the slightest. All, what this all leads to is attacks on Jews. It leads to dead Jews. When you demonize a subgroup, you demonize a minority, especially with the oldest hatred in the world, anti-Semitism, it leads to real attacks. And the attack this past Saturday, the last day of Passover, was an abomination. What happened in Pittsburgh was, was an even worse abomination. And it's quite frightening, Mike, because you know, you know that I lived in England for 11 years in Western Europe, where the synagogues are like fortresses. You have police outside. You have uh, metal detectors to get inside. America was never like that, but we're, 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 we're nearly there. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's remarkable. And Shmuley, you know, in my book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, I chart the history of anti-Semitism among professing Christians and, and how deplorable and hateful that is. But in, in 47 years, for me as a follower of Jesus, I've run into great love for the Jewish people around the world, great respect for Israel, solidarity with Israel. I've run into it in Asia and Africa. I've run into it all over America, other countries. And what I'm seeing now is stuff I've never seen before. And some of it's coming from professing Christians like this guy, this 19-year-old. You read his manifesto. He's eloquent, articulate for a 19-year-old, but it's every standard anti-Semitic trope, including the blood libel. And then he's quoting the Bible, and he's speaking about being a Christian. I, I've been raising my voice about these very things in recent weeks because I've been running into it. So like you, it's a shocker to see this. What happened with the New York Times now? Because this, this ups things to yet another level. Yeah, the New York Times uh, cartoon, which appeared Thursday in its, in its international edition, was, uh, was shocking. It, it was really straight out of the pages of Der Sturmer from 1930s Germany. Uh, every disgusting, vile, anti-Semitic trope seems to have been included, with the sole exception of, say, uh, you know, a, a bar of gold. You have the Prime Minister of Israel... Uh, depicted as a dog. I mean, literally, the, 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 the most famous Jew in the world, a man who was just elected to his fifth term as prime minister and the only democracy in the Middle East, is depicted as a canine. He has exaggerated Jewish facial features, the big giant nose, uh, the, the dark eyes, the menacing eyebrows, and uh, he has a, a dog collar with, with uh, the Star of David. Uh, and we all know, you know, almost like a yellow armband that you, you might have seen God forbid in Germany. He has a dog. You know, he's, he's wearing this dog collar, which is the Star of David. Then on top of that, you have Trump, the hated Trump, now Jewified, now made into a Jew, wearing a yarmulke. Yep. And, and he's blind, and he's being duped and manipulated by the wildly controlling Jew to do the Jew's bidding. I mean, this is this is the... The, the most dangerous anti-Semitic canard. The Jews are out for world domination. They're parasites. They only ever seek to control and manipulate the powerful people for their own advantage. They are always guilty of dual loyalties. They can never be loyal to anything but 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 each other. Uh, and they're involved in a worldwide conspiracy. And and when this disgusting cartoon first appeared, the Times. First, they didn't apologize at all. They said that they're going to take it down because it was an error of judgment. Then, faced with worldwide condemnation, they did decide to finally apologize. But in typical Times fashion, instead of taking real responsibility, they said that the decision to publish the cartoon was taken by one editor without sufficient oversight, and they would now look into how it happened. Now, think about that. This is the most famous newspaper in the world, and what's their defense? We're incompetent. So... No, no real apology, no real, and, and the fact is, it's not true. It doesn't make a difference if it was the decision of a single editor. This cartoon got into the New York Times because of years and years of demonization of Israel. Exactly. Years and years of demonization of Netanyahu. It's part of their editorial line. And, and look, there's the, the Brett Stevens editorial where he says this goes back to the uh, the days of the Holocaust when the New York Times didn't publish things accurately to, to give a full picture then. So, I mean, who knows how far things go back, but it is shocking. It does reflect the sentiments that are out there. 
There was an editorial the other day that referenced Jesus being a Palestinian. I wrote an article rebutting it. Others wrote an article rebutting it. And then they put out, they, they put out uh, last day or two, just quietly, a correction. Oh, due to an editing error, Jesus was referred to here. Because of an editing error, an earlier version of this article referred incorrectly to Jesus' background. While he lived in an area that later came to be known as Palestine, Jesus was a Jew who was born in Bethlehem. Initially, they had him as a Palestinian. So, I mean, the standard Palestinian authority, he was the first martyr, he was a Shahid, he was a Palestinian. The New York Times buying into that. So, so Shmuley, we've got three minutes before the break. What, what can we do to make a difference and to push back against this horrific stuff that's going on? Well, well, Mike, as I said, evangelical Christians are doing so much already. They stand up for Israel. They support Israel. They agitate for Israel. Um, President Trump, I believe, is even on record as saying that one of the main reasons he moved the embassy, aside from his own conscience, of course, and his, his love of Israel and the Jewish people, is because uh, he knows that his supporters, who are mostly evangelical Christians, they wanted to see that move. They wanted to see Jerusalem recognized as the eternal capital of the Jewish people. But what, what, else, what, what more can be done is the Times needs to be lambasted. People should be writing letters. Um, you know, we're, I don't know if you're, your listeners know we fund giant ads in the New York Times on, on issues like this. We're going to be taking out an ad. People can go to my Facebook page, you know, Rabbi Shmuley, um, or Twitter, right to be through Twitter, Rabbi Shmuley. We're raising money to take out an ad in the New York Times calling for a boycott of advertising in the New York Times and a cancellation of subscriptions to the New York Times until they engage in serious reflection shown to us in the, in, with tangible results and how they editorialize about Israel and how they report about Israel. I mean, this is a wake-up call. We can't let them get away with it. And we should not be supporting an institution. I know it sounds a little bit contradictory. You take out an ad calling for a boycott of an ad, but we, we do a lot of advertising in the New York Times. Mike. This isn't about one cartoon. It's about the editorial line. So if people want to support that ad, if people want to help us, you know, raise our voice, they can also write to me at info at shmuley.com, I-N-F-O at, at, at S-H-M-U-L-E-Y.com. We can give them more ideas. But in the meantime, keep the pressure up on the New York Times. All right. Awesome. Friends, Rabbi Shmuley, that's S-H-M-U-L-E-Y. Let's stand with him. Let's raise our voices. Let's push back. Good is going to overcome evil. We'll do it together. Hey, Shmuley, can't wait to see you soon and your family. That's the highlight. The debate's fun, but the highlight's hanging out. Can't wait to see you. Yeah, God bless you, Mike. God bless. God Thanks. Bless your family. All right. Thank you, sir. I've heard it over and over and over again. Today's Jews are not really Jews. Today's Jews are just Ashkenazi. They're converts of the Khazar kingdom. They're European. They're not really Jews. And the real Jews are either Africans or the real Jews are Christians because God's done with natural Israel. Well, well, what is this based on? Some of it's based on just the latest misinformation and internet myths and things like that. Some of it's based on the good research that traces back Jewish origins and recognizes that there's been Jewish intermarriage over the centuries. That's why we come in so many different colors and shapes and forms. But, but this idea that today's Jews are not really Jews or that even if Ashkenazi Jews or other Jews are ethnically Jewish, that they're not Jews in God's sight, it's based on a misreading of Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Paul is writing in Romans, and look at what he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who are of Israel are Israel. What was the point that Paul was making? He spoke from Romans 9, 1 to 5 of the anguish that he carried in his heart, the constant pain and anguish that he carried in his heart for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to whom the promises of God remain. He says, theirs are, not were, but theirs are the promises, all right? But he says, well, it's not as though the word of God failed because the Messiah came and the promised nation didn't follow. Does that mean the word of God failed because God made these promises to Israel? And his first response is, no, not everyone descended from Israel is Israel. He's not talking about the church as a whole. 
He's not talking about the Gentile world. He's not talking about everyone else. He's saying that there is a remnant within the nation, just as he says in first uh, in Romans 11, 1. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. This type of stuff is outright dangerous. It needs to be rebuked. It needs to be exposed. I have been raising my voice for decades, but in recent weeks, I have been raising my voice very clearly, saying that there is a rising tide of anti-Semitism that is wearing Christian garb, that it is dangerous, that to speak of the Jews a certain way, to demonize the Jews, it will lead to violence. I don't care how much you repudiated it, how much you say I'm against violence, when you keep demonizing people and keep spreading lies and keep spreading mischaracterizations and exaggerated, negative, destructive stereotypes and on and on, when you keep doing that, there will be violence. That's why I have been warning. That's why I have been raising my voice. I saw a question from someone watching on Facebook. Well, what about the slaughter of Christians? I've been talking about the slaughter of Christians day and night for years. We constantly draw attention to the persecution of Christians around the world, constantly. And I will raise my voice against the rising tide of anti-Semitism. We have seen what it has done. We have seen the reality of Jew hatred. Someone else to deal with. They're fake Jews and true Jews, and the fake Jews hide behind anti-Semitism. That is an anti-Semitic comment. First saying fake Jews, true Jews. Go through the New Testament. Look at every time the word Jew, Jewish occurs, all right? It's talking about definable people. It's talking about groups of people, whether they're believers in Jesus or not. It may be talking about leaders among the people or specific groups within them. But even among unbelievers, they're called Jews, 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 over and over. They're not fake Jews, but they're all the synagogue of Satan. <clears throat> These are the standard anti-Semitic interpretations. And when you draw attention to them, you're just, well, you're just hiding behind anti-Semitism. I'm telling you the truth. Now, now look, I had on my show a couple of weeks ago, Catholic scholar E. Michael Jones. He absolutely speaks against violence to the Jewish people, harming the Jewish people. And I told him plainly on the show in our candid conversation that his positions are anti-Semitic, that they are dangerous, that they have led to bloodshed. Well, I saw someone on my Twitter feed had made a comment. And let's just take a look at this tweet. It's no longer available. So obviously got deleted by Dr. Jones. But let's just take a look at this tweet. All right. Uh, From Dr. Jones, Dr. Michael Brown, there's my Twitter handle, is now blaming the Poway synagogue shooting on, quote, Christian anti-Semitism. This is a shameful misrepresentation of the situation. The shooter wrote a manifesto which nowhere mentions Christianity. So obviously he posted that before he himself had read the manifesto. All right. Or whatever he read was the only part of it. I replied, and but the reply didn't go through, so I just did a screenshot. That's when I found I, I couldn't find it. If that tweet's still there, I can't find it. I replied, Dr. Jones, did you not read his manifesto? He claims to be a Christian, the synagogue shooter. Cites the New Testament. The very verses you cited on my show, sir, and repeats the standard Christian anti-Semitic tropes. And, and I give a link. I give a link to his, to his manifesto. Let's just listen to some of the warnings I have issued. This first one is to comedian Owen Benjamin. Now, in the very video where I I took him to task, he speaks out against violence. He speaks out, and we don't want to harm. I'm saying the rhetoric you're using, what you're saying, the way you're saying it, will lead to violence. Here's what I said. I want to encourage Prager U, Dave Rubin, Stephen Crowder, those who've worked with Owen Benjamin in the past, you may be trying to reach out to him privately. You may be concerned about his mental or emotional state, but I want to encourage you to publicly separate yourselves from his comments and to denounce what he's saying in the clearest possible terms, because this stuff gets very dangerous. This type of rhetoric, especially with him saying, well, Jesus flipped the money table. So yeah, 
In other words, you get violent. Get violent against people. Get violent against these Jews. That's what he is espousing, and that's what we must warn people against. Yeah, I understand that he says, no, I'm not talking about violence. But when you demonize people a certain way, and when you say Jesus was not a pacifist, and go ahead and flip the tables, do you think every listener, every viewer is perfect, perfectly stable, be rational, going to work through everything in a reasonable, dispassionate way, and when you provoke them, provoke them, provoke them, provoke them, they say, oh, no, no, but don't get violent, that they're you're going to factor all that. No, we must be careful in what we say and how we say it. Look, there's a reason that the pro-life movement has been overwhelmingly pro-life and not killing people. Yes, there have been these horrific aberrations where an abortion doctor or worker uh, in a clinic was shot, or shot and killed, all right? But those have been the exception to the exception to the exception to this mass rule of decades of peaceful protest. Why? Because we are pro-life, and we couch things in certain terms that as much as we deplore the horror of abortion, we make it clear that we are pro-life. You must be careful and responsible with the words you use. There's a reason I keep drawing attention to what True News is saying, Rick Wiles and True News, and the errors they're propagating, and the exaggerations, and the stereotypes, and the mischaracterizations, and the anti-Semitic tropes. There's a reason I'm drawing attention to it. It's wrong, it's sinful, it's misinformation, but it leads to violence. No, I'm not saying Owen Benjamin is directly connected to the synagogue shooting, or E. Michael Jones, or True News. No, I am not saying that. Shout that out to the world. But I'm saying this type of rhetoric inevitably will lead to violence. And that's why when we get into this manifesto a little later in the show, you will see all the standard junk you're hearing from these different outlets, from these different individuals, from these scholars, from these news outlets. It's all the stuff that's in the manifesto. They're all drinking the same Kool-Aid. All right, so here's some of my warning to true news. Let's listen. Now, remember, for many years now, the Jews have been blamed for all the world evil. Whatever it is, during the Middle Ages, during the Black Plague, because less Jews died than Gentiles. Why? Hygiene, because of Torah. They still died. Plenty died, but not at the same percentage with which these others died. Obviously, the Jews, they poisoned the wells themselves. See, this was widely believed. Jews were slaughtered for this. When an economy fails in a country, it's the fault of the Jews. Yeah, so... You start scapegoating the Jews, blaming the Jews, demonizing just all the Jews, evil Jews, evil Jews, evil Jews, evil Jews, evil Jews. Well, somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to do something about it. And one of the most painful things to read with this 19-year-old, this this murderer, is he's eloquent. He's articulate. He's thinking about values and what matters most, and he's willing to sacrifice his life for this noble cause. Yeah, that's sick. That's evil. But that's where these lies lead. They always have. They always do. They lead to violence. Here's where I took issue with with E. Michael Jones. And you'll see a very verse, same verse, that the, the shooter quotes from. E. Michael Jones quoted from and said, based on this, the Jews killed Christ and the Jews are hostile to all men. I just suggest let's read it in a different translation. Go ahead. If you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning verse 14 in in Greek, uh, here I'll read from New King James, which is hardly meant to be avant-garde or or creative. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. So it's speaking about a certain group of people in Judah, Jewish leaders who historically had opposed prophets, opposed Jesus, and they were the ones hostile to all mankind, as opposed to the Jews killed Jesus. And the Jews are hostile to all mankind because certainly, you know, historically, that that's been used to persecute Jews and discriminate against Jews through the centuries. I have many friends of mine growing up, they came home from school crying, mommy, who's Christ? The the other boys say that I killed Christ. So surely you know how that phrase has been used 
per, uh, to perpetuate Jewish bloodshed through the centuries. The Jews are Christ killers, but you seem to be affirming that statement. And he did affirm that statement very clearly. And then one last suggestion I urged on him, and he politely, we were polite with each other, ab absolutely civil with each other in the midst of our deep disagreements. But I, I urged him one last thing at the end of the broadcast. Let's just listen to this before the break. I, I would just make this last appeal to you. We've got under two minutes. And I appreciate you willing to come on. And, and I'm happy to dialogue off the air, on the air, whatever the setting is. All I'm saying is the broad brush with which you paint and the broad statements you make are such that they encourage Jew hatred. They encourage demonization of Jews. I've seen the way things have played out with comedian Owen Benjamin. And then when I took issue with some things, he said the amount of stuff that came my way about these evil Jews. Uh, it was such we had to disable comments for a YouTube video, which we, we virtually never do. Only twice we've done in 1,600 videos. I'm just seeing the effect of it. So we've got a minute. You get the last word. But that's my appeal to you to reconsider your use of terms and rhetoric. Right. So he appreciated my advice, but said thanks, but no thanks. I'm saying it once again. I'm raising a voice of warning once again. The type of rhetoric that is being used. The Jews are guilty of this. The Jews are subver subversive. The Jews own the White House. The Jews own this. The Jews are enslaving everybody. The Jews want to take over the world and decapitate Christians. All this nonsense, it must stop or it's going to lead to more violence. And we, as followers of Jesus, need to distance ourselves from this because this is what Jews have thought through the centuries. Christians hate the Jews and Christians want to see us die. God forbid that lie is raised up in our midst on our watch. We'll be right back. You know, we've heard for years now, love is love. Love wins. And I have the right to marry the one I love. And, and maybe you know a gay couple, maybe family members or friends, and they really seem to love each other. Maybe they're raising kids. They love their kids. They're devoted to each other just like a heterosexual couple. You say, Sh surely, love should just accept that and embrace that. And, and many, e even, even professing gay Christians, would point to Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. And that tells us that love does no harm to its neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. So if I know that telling my neighbor that homosexual practice is sin is going to hurt them, aren't I harming them? If God is love, won't he affirm a loving relationship? All right, let me make this clear. The reason that Scripture opposes homosexual practice and homosexual relations is because God is love. And because God is love, he wants what is best for us. And he didn't make a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman. They may be loving, they may be kind, they may be devoted to each other, but God did not make men for men or women for women. God has something better. The first thing is for people to truly know him as Savior and find forgiveness of sins, whatever those sins might be. The second is to find wholeness and completeness in him. I know folks who used to be practicing homosexuals who are now happily married heterosexuals. I know others that used to be practicing homosexuals that are now celibate. They haven't seen a change in their desires, but they love the Lord and they've crucified the flesh and they're fulfilled as single believers. This much I know. If I affirm homosexual practice, if I tell that couple, God bless you, I want to affirm you as a follower of Jesus, I am not helping them, I'm hurting them. The relationship is wrong in God's sight. The relationship is not the best that God has for them. And ultimately, if they come to understand that God is against it, now they're living in open, willful sin. And Scripture makes very plain that those who practice adultery, those who practice fornication, those who practice drunkenness, those who practice homosexuality will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So out of love for those who identify as gay, 
we tell them God has a better way. And we say, no, he does not bless homosexual practice. You may have desires, you may struggle with those desires, but God does not affirm them. Instead, he says there is forgiveness for every sin committed and there is grace to overcome and lead a life of holiness. And that is the life that will be blessed, a holy life by God's grace. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. We're focusing on the synagogue shooting this weekend in Poway, California. This is Michael Brown, 866-34-TRUTH. I have a new edition of my book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, coming out in September. And just yesterday, as we're doing the final edit on it, I added in some things with reference to what happened this weekend and the warnings we have been sounding for weeks. If you've watched this broadcast, listened to this broadcast, read my articles, you know there has been a steady stream of warning, more than you've heard from me in all the years we've been on the air, about a rising tide of, quote, Christian anti-Semitism. Let me be plain. You can criticize Jewish people without being an anti-Semite. You can have differences with Jewish people without being an anti-Semite. You can criticize the state of Israel without being an anti-Semite. And there is such a thing as anti-Semitism, which is demonizing of a people, which is mischaracterizing of a people, which is speaking of a people as a whole in ugly and untrue things. That is anti-Semitism. And if you say, well, you're just playing your anti-Semitism cards, that's anti-Semitism. There you go. 866-34-TRUTH. Before we go to the phones, I, I just want to take a minute to repudiate some of the junk that's in the Shooter's Manifesto. So why even give it the time of day? There's a reason. You'll see why. There's a reason. Listen first to what the Shooter says. <clears throat> I would die a thousand times over to prevent the doomed fate that the Jews have planned for my race. So I'm willing to sacrifice everything, job, loving wife, amazing kids. I'll sacrifice it all to protect, you know, the European Caucasians. I would die a thousand times over to prevent the doomed faith that the Jews have planned for my race. By the way, this guy's a Trump hater. And he thinks that Trump is a Jew lover. All those are uh, Trump's anti-Semitic. And yeah, right. <clears throat> this guy's a Trump hater. So you know that. So. The, this idea the Jews want to take over the world and kill everybody, it's a, it's a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie. It's false. It's a lie. I read, that, well, then you read it wrong. Then you misunderstood it. Why is this a source that says that the, Jew, that the Jews are going to rule the world and this is what's going to happen? Maybe you're looking at something about when the Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom, what Messiah is going to do, the wicked. Maybe you're looking at a rabbinic text. But either way, I'm telling you, this is not, this is a lie, but the guy believes it, and he's willing to shoot up and kill innocent people. All right, so let's listen. It's a little bit long, but I want you to hear it. Then we'll go to the phones. Every Jew, he writes, this is part of the anti-Semitic libel, every Jew is responsible for the meticulously planned genocide of the European race. Every line of that is false. Every line, every word of that. They act as a unit, also a lie, and every Jew plays his part to enslave the other races around them, also a lie whether consciously or subconsciously. Oh, so they're all doing it, don't even know it. Their crimes are endless, he writes, for lying and deceiving the public through their exorbitant role in news media. What's interesting is that Jews often get blasted in the news media for using usury and banks to enslave nations in debt and control all finances for the purposes of funding evil. There you have it. Jews control all the money, all the banks, and they do it to fund evil. For their role in starting wars and a foundation of lies, which have costed millions of lives throughout history. Yeah, obviously started the Civil War and obviously started World War I and obviously started World War II and probably behind the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor and all that too and started the Vietnam War. And <clears throat> for their role in cultural Marxism and communism. Yeah, they had a role. They have a role in everything. They live in societies. They're often influential people for good or bad. Here, you, you want a little soundbite? Jews are like everybody else except more so. How do you like that? Jews are like everybody else except more so. Good qualities, bad qualities. Positives, negatives. It's just that they tend to do things with more influence. So when they have good influence, it's greater. Bad influence, it's greater. Simple. 
Simple. <clears throat> Let's keep going. For pushing degenerate propaganda in the form of entertainment. That's all the Jews. That's all the Jews. For their role in feminism, which has enslaved women in sin. So of course, there's no more anti-feminist movement than, than traditional Judaism in terms of a, a woman's role and place, etc. but in an honoring way. No, 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 no. Were, okay. For causing many to fall into sin with their role in peddling pornography. Yeah, you Hefner, famous Jew, right? <clears throat> For their role in voting for and funding politicians and organizations who use mass immigration to displace the European race. So that's it. So that all, all the, the pro-immigration bring them in, that's a Jewish plot to eliminate the European race. For their large role in every slave trade for the past 2,000 years. Another lie that the Jews were predominantly involved in the slave trade. For promoting race mixing. Supposed to Jews wanted to be separate? <clears throat> For their cruel and bloody history of genocidal behavior. Oh, yeah, this, the Jews killed everybody in the Holocaust, and the Jews killed everybody under Stalin, and the Jews killed everybody in, in, in communist China. Yeah, my, I'm not going to say forgive my sarcasm. It's merited. For their persecution of Christians of old, including the prophets of ancient Israel, Jeremiah and Isaiah. Well, Jeremiah and Isaiah were not Christians. These were Jews, fellow, fellow, persecuting fellow Jews. Have Jews in history been involved in persecuting Christians? Uh-huh, yeah. The reverse has been true 99% of the time because of social status. But yeah, Jews have been guilty of that. Mm -hmm. Have been. It's a shame. Have been. I've been on the wrong side of that. Pro killed our own prophets. Yeah, we've done that. And we'll also revere our prophets. Done that too. Uh, and and the, the Christians of, oh, and Stephen, martyrdom of Stephen. So that was a Jew being killed by fellow Jews, for the record. Uh, Christians of modern day Syria and Palestine. So the Christians being slaughtered by Muslims in Syria. And, and the Christians under evil leadership, uh, under radical Islamic leadership, say in Gaza, that's the fault of the Jews. The Jews are killing the Christians in Syria. I guess the Jews are ISIS then. I guess the Jews are Sunni and, and, and Shiite Muslims. I guess the Jews are Saudi Arabia and Iran. You see how crazy this is? <clears throat> and by the way, when we post this, you're going to watch the comments flooding in, justifying all these and calling me a, a non-Christian Jew lover, a Zionist shill, etc. You wa watch and see the comments that come in, backing, backing what's in this manifesto, shamelessly backing it. You watch and see, friends. Okay. Um, uh, for their, and Christians in white nations, right? So Jews are killing Christians in white nations. For the degenerate and abominable practices of sexual perversion and blood libel, you are, not, have not, you are not forgotten, Simon of Trent, the horror that you and countless children have endured at the hands of the Jews will never be forgiven. One of the classic libels, one of the libels that has, has cost Jewish people the most, and they have died the most for this, is this libel that at the time of Passover, Jews will kidnap a Christian child. This is widely believed to this day and taught in the Muslim world. Widely believed to this day that Jews will kidnap a Christian child and torture them and then drain their blood and use the blood for the making of Passover matzah. This is believed to this day. I documented that our hands are stained with blood. And here, this guy's saying, this guy said, well, you will never forget you. Believing all the lies. We're not speaking about these crimes. We're not attempting to stop the members of their race from committing them. So all the conservative Jews that stand for conservative principles and the traditional Jews who oppose homosexuality and oppose radical feminism and oppose abortion, oppose the, no, don't forget about them. They're not doing anything. Only ones that matter are the bad apples going in the wrong direction. And finally, for their role in the murder of the Son of Man, that is the Christ, every Jew, young and old, has contributed to these. For these crimes, they deserve nothing but help. Notice this. Every Jew, young and old, has contributed to these. This is evil. This is evil. Let me just tell you something. I'm not looking at comments on YouTube, Facebook, but if I see that you're coming on and pushing these things, you won't be welcome. You, you, can, you can have questions. We can have honest disagreement about all kinds of issues. But if you are going to come on our platform and push anti-Semitic lies, the very lies that led to murder this past Shabbat, this past Saturday, then you're not welcome to use our platform. I'm just telling you, are you censoring us? Yes. If you're going to use our platform to spread anti-Semitic lies, yes, you're not welcome. Absolutely. And that's our choice to make. Now, notice, notice the sickest part of all is he claims to be a Christian. He asks the question, how can you call yourself a Christian and do this? Surely the Bible calls for you to love your enemies. He replies, this is the murderer. Firstly, just because someone calls themselves a Christian 
does not make them one. Plenty of people wrongly identify with being Christian. Then he says this, beyond the scope of time, the Father and the Son made a covenant in eternity that the Son would bring a people to him that he may be glorified through them. I did not choose to be a Christian. The Father chose me, the Son saved me, and the Spirit keeps me. Why me? I do not know. Sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds Christian. Sounds like someone with more than a nominal upbringing and quite articulate and quite deceived. Jesus says you'll know a tree by its fruits. James, Jacob says faith without works is dead. 1 John 3, no murderer has eternal life. I wrote an article yesterday while flying from Orlando back to Charlotte. I wrote it with passion. It's on our website. It's on stream and elsewhere. A message to the Jewish community of America. The synagogue shooter was not a Christian. 866-34-TRUTH. We go to your calls. Uh, Ahmed in Ontario, Canada. Thanks for holding. Welcome to the line of fire. Good afternoon, Dr. Michael Brown. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. That's great. Um, Sir, there was an email that I sent uh, a couple of days ago when the shootings happened. Um, I not quite certain if you actually received it and read it. So if you could please allow me to maybe read it, so you could uh, so if you could please allow me to read it, and uh, you yourself and the audience could uh, perhaps uh, hear it from me. Yeah, okay? go go ahead, sure. Beautiful. Okay, uh, dear Dr. Brown, uh, the man whom I have great respect for. Um, I hope this email finds you well and in good health, sir. My name is Ahmed Kalaf, uh, a Muslim and a Palestinian who resides in Ontario, Canada. Uh, I was just on the phone with one of the rabbis in the city of North York. Uh, I want you to know that despite the difference, I stand in solidarity with our Jewish neighbors, just like I stood with our Christian brothers last week uh, for the heinous attacks on the church and the hotels in Sri Lanka. No one in the world deserves to die or even be harmed in any way for differences of faith. We hope for the best always, and may the Lord grant peace and mercy for those that are wounded and deceased. Kind regards. Well, this was my email to you, sir. Well, uh, Ahmed, thank, thank you for doing that and taking the time to do that. And absolutely, oh, uh, absolutely, I, I grieve with you over the, the slaughter in New Zealand and, and oh, over, you, over mistreatment and slaughter of Muslims. And I understand even with radical Islamic terrorism that it's, it's Muslim people who get hurt more by that than anyone. So we need right now, yes, we have differences in faith. We have differences in what we believe about Muhammad and Jesus and the Bible and Moses. We have profound differences, Mm -hmm. but we absolutely affirm 100% you should be able to worship in safety and practice your faith in safety. And a Muslim in America, a Jew in America, Canada, Christian in America, Canada, we should not have to look over our shoulders and wonder what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my Muslim neighbor because he goes to a mosque What's going to happen to my Jewish friend because she goes to a synagogue? What's going to happen to my Christian co-worker who believes the Bible? Ahmed, thank you for calling and writing the email. That means a lot to me. Thank you, sir. When I came to faith in 1971 and the immediate days after that, so I knew there were people that were called to be pastors and there were evangelists. I knew those too. So the evangelist, that was someone that traveled from church to church, and the pastor was one state of one place. That's what I knew. And, and then I found out that there's some called to be teachers, that Jesus spent a lot of his ministry teaching. That, that Okay, so that was another calling. But I remember asking one day, are, are there prophets around today? I asked my pastor, do you think there are prophets today? By which I thought of like an Isaiah, maybe in a cave somewhere today with a long beard and a scroll. And, right? and he said, yeah, I believe there's some prophets today. And, you know, the question of apostles, we didn't really talk about because you had the 12 apostles and that was it. But then you have Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11, speaking of Jesus when he ascended, that he gave the apostles, or he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, or pastors, and teachers. Now, some say this is what we call fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Some say it's really fourfold. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then pastor slash teacher. 
do these ministries all exist today? Yes, I believe they do. No, you don't have the 12 apostles or anyone functioning with that same authority today or writing scripture. But do you have people who are called to be apostles, just like, for example, Barnabas is called an apostle in Acts 14? It just means a sent one. These who are foundation layers, who are spiritual fathers, who might be church planters, who might be movement leaders. I believe, say, someone like Hudson Taylor or someone like William Booth, I believe they were apostles, even though they didn't carry that name or have that concept, I believe they are. One of my friends in India who's planted over 7,000 churches, who's planted ministries in other nations, who's built hospitals, who's been a prophetic witness for the Lord, who's almost stoned to death. It's the Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the line of fire, 866-34-TRUTH. We go straight to the phones. Uh, Jordan in California, thanks for calling today. Thank you, Michael Brown. It's great to hear from you again. Thank you. Go ahead. I've been watching over the news um, shooting that happened. It grieves, it grieves my spirit. Yeah. Tremendously. Um, my question to you was, would you be willing to possibly speak on my college campus about anti-Semitism? I don't think it's discussed enough on my campus. Um, where, where do you go to school, Jordan? I'm trying. Where do you go to school? Dr. San Bernardino. Got it. Yeah, the question is, would uh, obviously you need a group to sponsor it, right? You can't sponsor it as yeah. an individual. So you need a campus group to, to sponsor it. But if you can get a, a, a Jewish group would be less likely to sponsor it because I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. But, uh, you know, if I was just coming in as a, as a Christian and that was, that was it, you know, Gentile Christian, they'd be more open. But if you can get a, a Christian yeah. campus group or a conservative group to sponsor it, I'd be in California in a heartbeat. We'd figure out a way to, to make it work. Obviously, it's, it's late in the semester now. And uh, it'd be challenging uh, to make it happen. Could have to wait till the fall. But of course, uh, by, yeah, by all means. Uh, how do you think you could get it sponsored, Jordan? Um, I'm part of this group called Crew. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, uh, it used to be Campus group. Crusade, sure. Yeah, the quarter still going on. Doesn't end until uh, the middle of June. Ah, okay. Got it. Well, maybe there's a way to 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 make it happen, sir. So so listen. I would love to. Uh, is, stay, stay on the line for a second, all right? And uh, it's just okay. going to take a, a minute. Uh, Howard is going to come back on, and he is going to tell you who to contact in our ministry, okay? And I'm just typing okay. out info for him right now because my team can't read my mind, and typing and talking at the same time. So, Howard, you just give that email information to Jordan, and let's see if we can set it up. Finances are immaterial. Don't worry about that part. The key thing is to get an, a setting where I can come in and speak freely and we can, we can get a good turnout. That's the key thing. That we get a turnout of people. We promote it however we know how. Finances are secondary to the, to the larger thing. All right? That's, that's an issue, but it's a secondary issue to making it happen. All right. Uh, 866-34-TRUTH. So, uh, Howard... Great. Take it from there. Let's go to Ian in San Diego, right near Poway, California. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, good afternoon, brother. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, my question is about loving our enemies. And in regards to the perpetrators of these massacres, how Christ commands us to, to love everyone and not repay evil for evil. Um, but, you know, I do wonder about, would it be so bad for Christians to get together and pray, uh, you know, that the Lord would rebuke them before such a thing would take place? Like, you know, uh, in regards to the book of Revelation, it talks about the two witnesses and how they're given power and authority to, uh, one of the things they're able to do is, um, you know, send plagues upon the earth whenever they desire. And it seems like there'd be a, there could be an effective way of, like, stopping these things from happening before they happen. And I just wonder what, what you think about yeah. that. So, so Ian, uh, first, uh, through history, we've, we've not stopped evil from happening through 2,000 years of history through the cross. We haven't 
We haven't stopped all types of atrocities and horrific things from happening. I'm sure there are things that could have happened and would have happened without us, but we, we have not just universally gone around stopping them. And the idea of, okay, we're, we're going to call down plagues on people, whatever, then, then we become God. So let's leave the two witnesses to the two witnesses in Revelation. That being said, we absolutely work against evil however we can. For example, if we knew an attack was coming, we, we notify the authorities, we have people evacuate, we do what we know how to do. If, if, there were, uh, if, if there was military action to be carried out about, against terrorists, we regret that they're going to die in their sin. But if they don't repent and they're taken out by the government, by the military, so be it. And uh, we, in our prayers, we pray that God will bring people to repentance. That's our greatest prayer, that they'll come to repentance and turn away from evil, that God's kingdom would come and his will be done. So certainly we are praying against these things. By all means, by all means, we pray against these things happening. But we know in this world, until Jesus returns, there, there, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be sin. There's going to be junk going on. But our prayers do make a difference. And, and then, as far as loving our enemies, uh, I believe this young man uh, should either spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole or suffer the death penalty. I believe that is right and righteous. And his manifesto says, oh, you know, I'll get out of prison, eventually continue the fight. No, no, you forfeit your life. You take a life, you forfeit your life. You do it willingly, knowingly, you forfeit your life. So either life in prison without parole or, or uh, death penalty. Either way, I want to see him repent. I want to see him really come to know the Lord. I, I don't wish hell on him. I wish his repentance. That's what I desire to see. But let there be justice and let us do what we know how to do and let us pray against these evil things from taking place. Thank you, sir, for calling and asking the question. Uh, let's go to Romeus in Nebraska. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello. Thank you, Michael Brown, so much for, uh, for taking my call. Uh, I have been listening to you now for about, um, I would say, a year. And your uh, radio ministry has been a tremendous uh, blessing uh, to me. I've uh, learned a lot of... Uh, things that I wanted to know, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. That's just two of us talking. We're and good, baby. I, We're good. Okay, yes, and uh, I've had, uh, got a lot of questions I uh, answered um, that I've uh, pondered on but never really um, got the answers to uh, through your radio show. And then, uh, secondly, I just want to give my sincere uh, condolences to everyone that was um, affected um, by the synagogue uh, shooting. Um, I think that that is a definitely a tragedy. Um, I believe that, you know, um, Israel, uh, the Jewish people are um, truly, uh, you know, uh, blessed uh, by God. Um, but my, um, another question I had is, um, I, I, I know that you're, you know, you're Jewish. So, um, you know, you, you have a real strong connection uh, to that community. And when something like that happens, you... Um, you, you, you you feel it a little bit more, but I'm just wondering why um, I don't hear um, kind of like you cover the same things when unarmed uh, African Americans uh, get shot, um, you know, by the police. Um, that you know, you know. Yeah, I, I, actually, if you had Romeus, if you had first, thanks for the kind words. Uh, but we spent months and months with the uh, the Trayvon Martin shooting and the shooting of my namesake, Michael okay. Brown, and, and others, and, and Eric Garner, and, and, and these... Uh, okay, my apologies. No, 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 that's, Romeus, no, that's perfect. No need to apologize, sir, but that's, that's it's perfectly legitimate question. Um, and uh, the, the, and I, I have uh, African-American friends I interact with constantly to, you know, do you think I'm missing anything? Is there, am I lacking in sensitivity here or there? Uh, my big issue with this is, is the the history that we've had with Jew hatred and the fact that it's rising in America in a dangerous way. That's why I'm speaking about it a, a lot. I spoke about it more in the last three weeks than in, in probably the last three years. And then, you know, the slaughter of Nigeria, you know, blacks in, in Africa, right? Nigerians, I've been drawing a lot of attention to that, written quite a few articles ab about the Fulani herdsmen and, and other Muslims killing Christians in Nigeria, so so they're 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 black, they're African, as as well, 
Uh, and then, of course, you know, our hard cry for the Sri Lankans who are, who are people of color being slaughtered in, in their country a couple of weeks ago. But as, as things are relevant, sir, as, as we do see injustice, if there are, if there are issues of, of systemic racism in the court system, anything, we, we've absolutely addressed those things for sure. But that, hey, what means a lot to me is that you enjoy the show and you had a question and you asked an honest question. So thank you. That means a lot to me. Thanks for being able to do that. Um, and by the way, one of the things that's really enriched me is interacting with callers from different backgrounds, ethnically, uh, it, different backgrounds of color, religion, et cetera. It's, it's helped enrich me as our perspectives are shared. Hey, thank you again for the kind words and the call. Hey, listen, friends, I want to play a clip for you. Lois Ferberg, uh, she's got a great book, uh, Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus, where she talks about Hebraic thinking and so on. We've, we've got a special offer with a Skype interview I did with her. It's never been aired, plus her book. Just, just check this out. Listen to what she says. Isaiah 53, uh, where it talks about, surely he, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow like a lamb led to the slaughter. Theologians will say, let's just talk about, let's compact it down into... Uh, one word or uh, a phrase, substitutionary atonement. And so we, that's an abstraction, you know, like what we were talking about, changing these concrete ideas into abstractions. Mm -hmm. so we compact it down into one word, one phrase there, uh, which is very clinical and analytical. It has no emotion in it. But if you look in the New Testament, over and over and over, it talks about Jesus as the Lamb of God. Mm. And that's a clear reference back to Isaiah 53. That's that's what I mean, the difference between East and West and how they think. Friends, we've got a great interview about transforming your perspective in reading the Bible and Lois's book. We've put it together for you. You can only get these resources together at our website, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org. Check it out. You'll be blessed. We'll be back with you tomorrow. 